Well, it's amazing some of the scriptures have been brought out this morning. I've, just been, I've been trying to do some more writing, and this, the very passage that Ron was talking about is, is one that I was just writing about, enumerating all of those terrible conditions of the last, day, last days when I think the worst one is a form of godliness. Yeah. Because all the rest, it's obvious, they're evil. But a form of godliness is one that Satan allows, but it has no real effect on his kingdom. It, it deludes people into thinking everything is great when it's not. What God is after. And I believe there's people here who can remember when this church was, and not in this location so much, but when, this, when there was a move of God in this place. There was a powerful presence. You didn't come in here and just say, oh, well, isn't this a nice group of people? There was, ooh, there was an electricity in the atmosphere. And it's not that we want to try to ch uh, chase down a feeling or a, sir, any kind of particular manifestation. I don't know what God's, how God means to do what he's going to do. But I know that we cannot simply stay where we're at. We will slide back or we will go forward. And the question is, which are we going to do? And are, are we going to be willing to fight the battles that need to be fought in order to do that? And I just like to throw out the thing that Joel referred to, and I appreciate his confirmation of it. I did have it on my heart to do it. I was going to take my time and share it with others, but I think uh, the way I put it, I think it will be all right. I mentioned, first of all, I'll mention that there seems to be many examples, there seem to be many examples of times when the ministry of the word was undergirded by somebody praying during the preaching of that word. Finney is one example. Another example, I, uh, I guess I, I heard again because I read the biography of uh, John Hyde when I was young. Anybody know who John Hyde is or otherwise known as Praying Hyde? There's a handful of people who know who he was. He was a uh, a missionary to India. He was born in 1865, died in the early 20th century. But the Indians knew him as the man who never sleeps. He just had a particular gift and calling of God to pray. And I'll tell you, when he went out to give out the gospel, there was hardly a day that went by that people weren't converted. There was a power in his ministry and he, he attributed everything about it to prayer. He just spent hours, and that's where the battle was won, and he was just going out and just reaping the results of what had really already happened. But I read the account of a man in England, a, a servant of God, a preacher of the word, who was holding a, uh, a meeting of some sort, and it seemed like there was a great deal of opposition in the spirit. And I can tell you, I've come in here on some Sunday mornings, and I felt that. It's just like, you felt like you're just pushing against something. Well, that's not just a vague feeling. I believe many times that's the case. There is a real opposition in the, in the realm of the spirit. We cannot afford to just come to church and expect everything's going to just sort of happen. But anyway, this meeting was going on, and then I don't remember all the circumstances, but the basic thing was John Hyde arrived. And someone passed a note to this man, to the, to the leader of the, of the meeting, and when John Hyde came, he didn't come and sit on the front row and say, amen. He went in a closet and he prayed and he poured out his heart to God with, using the gift that God had given him. And almost instantly, that meeting turned and people started getting converted and being broken. And there was a breakthrough in the spirit because somebody who had a gift from God to pray was crying out to God. And I believe there's, there's examples that we know of today where there's people who are praying where Kenny's going to church this morning, by the way, he had the opportunity to be in Brooklyn. They don't just, uh, uh, you know, come and say, well, praise God, we're going to have another good service. They've got a prayer band that know how to pray. I can tell you personal experience. Because I've had some of them come and personally pray for me and Sue on that one last trip that we made up there. There's some people who know how to pray. It's not just a typical little, okay, I'll lead in prayer. This is a real anointing from God. And, uh, you know, the, the, what we heard the other night, that church in Georgia, there are people who pray during the message. You wonder why things are more effective than others? I believe there's something here. And what I just want to throw out is this, because I don't know what God's plan is. The worst thing we could do is set up a program. Try to organize something. 
That's not our business. He's the head of the church. I'm not. We're not. But it just might be that God would raise up people with a true ministry in prayer. We've had some in the past, haven't we? Some of you have been around a while. You know that there were some old saints that had a particular gift to pray. You wonder why this church was so blessed in its beginnings? It was born in prayer. There were people who were especially anointed of God to pour out their hearts. I, I was thinking of Brother Kumar. We were taken on our first visit back into a, a village and to a, to a small house there, and we met an elderly lady. Her husband was deceased, but was been around 100 years old. But he was a prayer warrior that God, that God gave to Brother Kumar in the beginning of that ministry. He, Brother Kumar's testimony was that he, he almost never went there, but that he found David Dharma on his knees, pouring his heart out to God. And God just mightily used that man to break into a demon-controlled area and establish a work for God. He had a gift to pray for people. He prayed for sick animals and they'd be healed. God just worked in a special way. But anyway, back to this. It may just be that God wants to raise up some prayer warriors. I don't know. And all I would do, all I would suggest is this. Pray. Ask God. And I would say don't make any hasty decisions. We don't want anybody running up after the church saying, oh, pick me, pick me. But if you pray and you spend time and you ask God, and God really gives you a faith and a burden, it might just be that we could cut, reach the point where there would be some people in another room someplace in this building while the service is going on. Of course, the thing is, we don't want to just put it all off on people like that. We all need to have the burden and realize the, the absolute connection between what you do and how you live and how you come in and what happens here on, on a given service. I'll tell you, I sense, and it's pretty, it should be pretty obvious, that God has a burden here this morning. It's been laid on several people's hearts. That didn't come from us. That isn't, we just didn't get together and say, hey, we need to stir the pot here a little bit. God is concerned. It's the easiest thing in the world to go to sleep and to settle. But that's not the nature of Christ. That's not the nature of his church. And I believe that if we will take hold of, well, the horns of the altar is one illustration in Scripture, that God is looking for us to cry out to him as we perhaps never have before. And I mean with a faith, God is going to answer and God is going to move. So I'll just throw that particular thing out. If nothing comes of it, well, praise God, we're just going to go on and we're going to look to God. If something does and it's evident that it's God is the doer, and he's the one that's given the, the gift and the ability. Well, we'll just kind of work from there and just see what he does. But I'll tell you, I, anybody who stands up here feels the need of some power. You know, a fireman can have the greatest hose in the world. It might be the latest technology. It might have just everything that it needs to do to do the job to fight that fire. He might even have some water coming out a little bit. But you know, if there's going to be a lot coming out, there's going to have to be something behind it. And I think that's a pretty good illustration of what prayer is. And you don't have to have the perfect scriptures. You don't have to have the perfect words. If God's spirit is there, that's what we need. You know, I was just thinking of the testimony I heard Paul Washer give one time. I mean, he, he just set himself to seek the Lord and, and, until the Lord would really come. I mean, he went days and days and days and days and days with nothing happening and just waiting and just saying, all right, God, here I am. Okay, God, see you later, you know, an hour later or something like that. Just a persistence. I'm going to come back until you bless me. I'm going to come back until I, until I experience your power. And I, I don't remember every detail, but I remember there was a meeting with a, a tremendous resistance in it. I mean, there were people that were just like openly mocking God in that meeting. It was just a, you know, like, like the devil was saying, I defy you to accomplish anything here. And he got up before the people. I don't think he was the 
typical one. I wish I could remember all the circumstances. Some of you can help me with this later. 